Um, the, obviously, the reason that we developed it is in response to this gap in the market. We recognized a number of years ago, you know, again, PMAC, supply chain, great stuff, highly reputable, good for what they're doing. NIGP, government focused, great government overview, not rooted in Canadian law. So there was this gap in the marketplace. Nova Scotia government, very proactive in filling this gap. So it just the timing worked for us. We were about three quarters of the way building our program. We had no market. They had no program but a market. So it just all sort of fell into place together. The first level, the program is designed on three levels. So the first level is what we call 101, and it's an introduction to public sector procurement. So it's on, entirely online, self-directed. About eight hours start to finish. We say about because it's online. People are moving at their own pace. I think they have, is it three months they have to complete? Six months to complete it. So in that sense, they do maybe a module a night or something like that. It's great, of course, for that one-off person that just needs an overview of public sector. Um, quizzes and interactives and drag and drops and white papers and readings throughout it, um, trying to keep it as engaging as we can. For both level one and level two, we have that pre-course assessment that Rob uh, alluded to, so that, that testing beforehand and then testing the same competencies after the training, and the idea is to sort of measure the learning. So we test on the competencies ahead of time, an online quiz, and then of course after we test and it's that way of sort of measuring learning. It's not an exact science, but it's a way to sort of demonstrate that ROI and make sure that people are actually picking, picking up some valuable information throughout it. So like level one is a prerequisite for moving forward in the program. We didn't want a situation where people come into the classroom sessions without all having that base level of understanding, because that would set, set us back. You'd go backwards into, into issues that should have been covered off. Level one is standalone, though. They don't have to go forward in the program, but they have to have level one if they're going to go to level two, which are two-day classroom sessions. And there is a pre-course online assessment. They do a quiz afterwards, again, to measure that learning. There's some electronic pre-reading that goes out ahead of time. And the, the classroom courses, of course, this is the practical piece. This is where we take the theory, we get in there, we roll up our sleeves, and we actually work with these things. We work with case studies and exercises, and as you heard, that sort of sharing and networking that goes on in the classroom. Like, oh, well, we do it this way. Oh, we've never thought of doing it that way. Can you say more? And so we do digress a little bit in the classroom into those kinds of, uh, those kinds of discussions, which I think are very valuable. What I've done looking at level two is I've just picked a couple of random topics that I wanted to touch on for you. It's not an overview. It's not just a few things that I pulled out that I thought I could show you how we use stories and we use case studies and we use real life court cases to solidify learning. Those of you that have studied learning, you know, it uses a different part of your brain when you get into stories and it actually helps people retain and, 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 and learn a lot, lot more easily. So sort of three topics I picked that over-reliance on consultants. I think this is a trend we're seeing more and more of. It works in some circumstances, but it's got its pitfalls. Um, negotiations, one of the things we're seeing, more and more negotiations, whether you're in contract day or not, there's certainly some pitfalls around that, and then the ever-present scope changes issue. So over-reliance on consultants. So one of the things we talk about in, in the level two is a case called Borshire Concrete at Port Hawkesbury. A fairly recent case where a municipality, quite straightforward, they're building a civic center. They hire an outside project manager to run the process, right? That's what they do is they run these construction projects. Um, the outside project manager, highly experienced, incredible. So this wasn't a fly-by-night guy. This was a very experienced project manager. He went out and he issued the tender for supply and install of the concrete bleachers. So one component of this project. They had one bid only that came in from Borshare, and that bid was substantially over their internal budget. So at that point, could the project manager have canceled the process? Good faith reason to cancel? Let me think. Yeah, yeah, certainly if they're all over budget, good faith reason to cancel. However, he didn't cancel the process. What he did is he went to an outside concrete supplier outside of the process and negotiated a deal and signed a deal with an outside <coughs> concrete supplier. Bore Sherrett sitting back going, I was the only bidder. Are you kidding? This process is still live. You know, so of course, getting it, going to court through it, because Borshare's competitors now won that, pro that, that project contract. The ruling, the court concluded, municipality had breached contract A, not surprisingly. Now think about it, this project manager working on behalf of the municipality 
liability gets traced back to the municipality. It's not a way of just shifting that liability off. So he's an agent on behalf of the municipality. So the breach of contract A, liable for bid shopping, which is kind of one of those icky words, but it's basically taking for shares pricing and using it as a negotiating tool with that outside party. And we're not certain that's what went on, but it certainly raises that specter when you've got a live competition and you're working outside of it. The court said the conduct was an egregious attack on the integrity of the tendering system. So one of the things, of course, when it goes to court, it's public record. So that, that particular sentence from the judge you know, splashed all over the Port Hawkesbury Herald or whatever it would be. So imagine the political fallout from that kind of a comment showing up on the front page of your small municipal publication. Court said the project manager simply did not appreciate the extent of obligations owed to the plaintiff. Simply didn't know. It wasn't trying to do anything wrong. Damages, not a huge amount of damages. I think the real damage is in the comments and the court case itself and what Bohr shared is saying to his buddy companies about how this all went down and what the reputation now of the municipality is when it goes back out for tender on issues. So again, a very basic procurement mistake. The lesson of course that we teach in level two is just because they're a project manager doesn't mean they're a procurement expert. Just because they're an engineer doesn't mean they're a procurement expert. Just because they're a lawyer doesn't mean they're a procurement expert. So we, we tend to sort of attach ourselves to, oh, he's an engineer, he must be able to do this. Great engineer, perhaps not a procurement expert. So it's just some of those things that we're starting to see emerge. We use these cases to sort of reinforce that, just be careful on how you do it. Like any other expert, make sure they're qualified in the area of expertise that you're relying on them for. We also have a case study that we want to do as a little exercise with you guys, just to get you, again, a little bit of a flavor of how we work with this. Um, this is the case study that's there in front of you on the table. And you're going to be judged, so. Anyone who's in the legal edge may recognize this one, but so what constitutes failed negotiation? We just selected some, one that's fairly straightforward. So this is a federal government, along with five other proponents. Zenex submitted a proposal in response to a request for abbreviated proposals, they call it, request for proposal from DCC, uh, for life safety assessment and remediation analysis. As the highest ranked proponent, Xenex entered into negotiations with Defense Construction as anticipated in the RFP. During negotiations, Xenex offered to lower its price for services, had further discussions about including certain elements. Following these discussions, months passed Zen with Xenex hearing nothing from DCC. So we're having these discussions, we're negotiating, and then all of a sudden, dead silence. After repeated inquiries, Xenex finally learned that Defense Construction had initiated negotiations with and awarded to the second ranked proponent. Defense Construction never notified Xenex that negotiations were at impasse or that its pricing was still out of line, nor that Defense Construction did they give them a final opportunity to refine their pricing. All communication with Xenex simply stopped. Of course, when it goes to court, the first place they look is what is the language in the document. So the document actually anticipated negotiations. They said negotiations will include an agreement on the maximum amount for services authorized by DCC. In the event these negotiations fail, DCC will enter into negotiations with the second rank proponent. So how many of you have similar language in your documents? Okay, so similar is quite common. You know, you negotiate with the first one, if it fails, we move on. But you can see it from Xenex perspective. Well, what do you mean it failed? Nobody gave us that final opportunity. Defense construction is saying, well, this is common language in an RFP. We always do this, right? We gave you a shot at it. It didn't work out. We moved on to our second front runner. So that's kind of loosely the issue. What constitutes failed negotiation? So if you just have a little chat at your table, let me know what you think. Do you think DCC is going to be liable for Xenix? Should they have done something more? Do you think that Xenix is just going to have to wear this? How could DCC have handled this differently? to avoid the problem altogether. Okay, so let's get a little bit of a discussion. So this is exactly what we do in the classroom, is we put them into a real life scenario. A little bit more time. Okay, and this is often what happens as well. Because they want to dive into it. Okay. So let's just, uh, maybe we'll do this by way of show of hands. Some really good discussion going on out there. How many of you think that Xenex, the bidder, is going to win something here? How many think that the owner, DCC, is, is doing what they said they were going to do? 
Okay, most of you not putting up hands. <laughs> this one was a bit of a surprise for me because I've seen that kind of language in RFPs all the time. It went to, and Ewan's just handing out sort of the answer, if you will. Um, it went through the Canadian International Trade Tribunal because, of course, federal government procurement goes through the Trade Tribunal here. They said, DCC, you violated the terms of this process. This is the, they called it a request for abbreviated proposals. You violated the terms of the process. You breached AIT and NAFTA. It said, DCC was required to notify Xenix that the negotiations had reached an impasse. They should have at least said, you know, you've got two days, give us your best and final offer, or some final opportunity, or if you can't sharpen your pencil anymore, we have to move on. So there should have been some dialogue around that. CITT went further and said that the DCC should have advised Xenix of the budget limit when they asked for a final price. Yeah. Ah, you know, I mean, you're negotiating. Do you actually disclose your budget limit? So it went off to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal upheld everything except that finding around the budget. They said, no duty to disclose your budget. That eliminates the whole purpose of a negotiation, really. So they said CITT went too far in finding that they should have disclosed their maximum budget, but left Xenix in the dark as to the status of contract, damages payable to Xenix for loss of profit. So again, a small case, but an important one. If you're moving more in the direction of negotiations, and I think most of us are, define your process. Or even if they didn't define the process, common courtesy would say, Give Xenix that final opportunity. Hey, you got two days to sharpen your pencil. Something like that. Better yet, build in a process because this is, a, again, a fairly straightforward case that wound up going through two levels of, of, of review and damages payable there. So let's look at another illustration. Scope changes in contract award, one of my favorite bugbears. This is a case that we touch on, certainly, in the program. Thompson Brothers and Wetaskiwin, City of Wetaskiwin. Again, it's pretty straightforward. City called for tenders for a park excavation project. So they had a big project, had an excavation project over here. They went out for tenders, they got some bids in, Thompson Brothers was the lowest bidder. Before they awarded the contract though, the city had a meeting and they had this big brainstorm and they said, well, we want them to excavate over here, but we've got a hauling piece over here in the park. So once they're on site, it makes sense to combine these two. So why don't we run a separate tender for the hauling piece and then award it to the cumulative lowest bidder on both those processes, right, brainwave. So they went to Thompson and they said, we have the second process for the hauling work, are you interested in submitting? And Thompson said yes. The one thing they didn't tell Thompson is that it was the lowest cumulative bidder. They just said there's a second process. Okay, you smell this one coming, right? So Thompson <laughs> Brothers did bid on the second tender. Also a company named El or Ser Central Services bid. Now Central <coughs> Services had been high on the excavation because it wasn't their core work, but very low on the hauling piece because that was their core kind of business. So cumulatively, Central ended up being the overall cumulative low bidder, awarded to Central Services for both pieces of work. Thompson's like, wait a minute, what? Uh, there was a public opening. I know I was the lowest on the first. Right, so takes it to court, and the court said contract award was not responsive to the tender process. So again, very basic procurement mistake. When's the time to have brain waves? <laughs> Back in the planning, planning, planning. Underpinning our entire program is this concept that proper procurement planning pays off tenfold downstream. You cannot give that piece short shrift. You have to really think about you know, the aggregation, do we have other projects we can lump together? Should we be separating them out to do some capacity building? Those are all the things to think about. It, because I think because it's not, for one thing, it's not very visible. It doesn't get those cost savings at the end of it. It's not that bottom line thing you can point to. And everybody's in such a hurry. You gotta get that RFP out. It's gotta be out on the street tomorrow. We just don't have time to talk. And so we're trying to turn that. We're saying, you don't have time not to plan properly. Because the ones that are not planned properly, those are the ones where you get, a million questions to your RFP, you get extensions, you get amendments, you get bids that aren't appropriate, you probably end up having to cancel. So the time spent up front really does pay off tenfold, but it's a, it's a tough hurdle. Yeah, it's, it's tough. And procurement knows it. You know, procurement generally gets it. They have trouble selling it to the users who need that stuff tomorrow. That's, that's really what they run into. So in the program, we, we try and give them tools and ammunition and explain to them why the planning is so important. But, yeah, it's really just the time combination of not having enough time or thinking we don't have enough time, and also it's not a very visible function, perhaps. I think it also ties in too with, with 
they have not understanding what your function in the whole aspect of procurement is. It's like, oh, well, we don't have to let them know until yeah. we're ready to ah, almost award. That's right. Well, yeah, exactly. Because they're the big roadblock. If we tell them too soon, they're yeah, just going to throw all those hurdles yeah. at us, right? So back to what Janet was saying is that's why it's so important to educate those end users. They probably don't need three days in the classroom, but they need they need to understand how high risk this area is and that your job is to protect them from themselves. Once they understand that, then I think the respect goes up and then you start to get the time that you need to do it properly. Tracy? And the specific skills on how to have those discussions. Mm -hmm. I think people know planning, even if you know planning is important, sometimes you don't know how to engage those other parties. What are the right questions to ask? Well, it's not yeah. the size of <laughs> no, no, no. Call it plan B. Yeah, yeah, that's the backup plan, <laughs> contingency plan. Um, other topics, and again, planning was a big one in level two. Um, planning, planning, planning. I actually have the, the level two planning course here, if anybody wants to flip through it. And I've got the solicitation and award course. I, I don't think we brought the managing evaluation, but they're there for you to look at. Risk assessment, and Rob alluded to this, how important it is for procurement folks to do proper risk analysis on the front end. So needs assessment, options analysis, cost benefit analysis, then you do the risk assessment on your selected option. Pretty dry stuff, it's pretty dry stuff. So when we're building exercise around that, Trace and I worked on this, we're thinking, well, you know, photocopiers with different functions, you can do your options analysis, not very exciting. So what we did is we tapped into a local example. How many remember the UVic bunnies? Right, the UVic bunnies. So it was all over the press. Of course, they'd never heard of it back east, of course, but we built an exercise. You know, you are a procurement manager for, you know, the University of Ontario. There's a burgeoning bunny population on, on campus, and your task is to come up with a recommended strategy for moving forward and how you're going to deal with this issue. So they have to go into the options analysis. You know, do we, do we trap and release them somewhere else? You know, do we sterilize them? Do we have someone go out in the middle of the night and euthanize them all? So going through all those options, and they do their risk analysis on each of those options, sort of a three-part exercise. But the other thing that it brings in is anal analyzing the political risk, which is different for a public sector than private sector, of course. So if you have someone go out and euthanize those bunnies in the middle of the night, Sure, probably the most cost effective, but think about the follow -up. You got the animal activists and it's gonna be on the front page and how do you defend that and all of that. So they had to factor in the political risk and the costs and benefits of all these options and then you know, then we, we were able to bring out all of the, the articles, you know, eight wily rabbits still remaining on campus, you know, all this kind of stuff. They just love it. And so we did rabbits in, in Nova Scotia in Halifax. You know, if we were to go to Newfoundland, we'd probably do moose because they have a big moose problem. You know, we do it in Toronto, we probably use raccoons. You know, here, probably deer, you know. So that's an example of how it can be adapted to fit something that's meaningful locally, but still maintain the core learning out of the exercises. So it's one of the funnest ones. What do you think, Tracy? Do you like doing the rabbit exercise? I loved it. They couldn't believe it was a real story, though. <laughs> yeah, they couldn't believe it was a real story. That was the big reveal of, this is actually true. They're like, no. No, it's really not, yeah. <laughs> Other things around planning, as we talked about working with those users, identifying their needs, clarifying what they want. Tracy uses a good expression, you know, you don't want to go out for steak and then learn they wanted spaghetti. Like, you've got to spend the time knowing what it is that they need. Um, assessing the market, designing your procurement strategy, drafting your documents, obtaining approvals. That's a common thread through each of these. What approvals do you need at each level? What documentation do you need in your files? Really important, you'll notice, I just want to loop back to this, documentation. The lead article in the legal edge here, poor evaluation process, cost federal government, more than $100,000. We don't even know if it was a poor evaluation process, it was a poorly documented evaluation process. If you read the decision, they couldn't determine that the right things were done, so they had to conclude they weren't done properly. So document, 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 get your approvals, keep things in files, because it's not enough to do the right thing. You have to be able to demonstrate you've done the right thing. And when you're handling dozens and dozens and dozens of contracts, very difficult, they all blur together. So get those approvals, get that documentation in place. <coughs> Managing an evaluation, that sort of third in the three classroom series. 
very, uh, very important skill sets around, you know, having those difficult conversations, addressing those issues head on, managing those service levels, looking in the mirror, you know, one of the things we do is, you know, one finger points that way, where the other three fingers point, right? So how did you contribute to this? That's sort of the first place to start. So we really give them the tools and the questions to ask when they're working through some of these things. How do they document it? How do we capture the, the evaluation report, post-contract evaluation, taking the lessons learned from this procurement then and looping it back into the planning for your next procurement cycle. So it sort of closes the loop, that, that third program, or third course in the program. Uh, and again, we've got the materials up front if anybody wants to look at it afterwards on the break here. Level three, this is the final level for the certificate, and this one is entirely online, but it's different. It's interactive peer-to-peer. -peer. So there are some modules that, that sort of pull together and recap everything we've learned to the program so far. The bulk of the course is in the threaded discussion forum where they discuss case studies, they discuss examples, they discuss issues, and actually 40% of their mark for the, that course is based on their participation in that threaded discussion. And it's not the number of times you post, it's the quality of the postings. It's are you provoking critical thinking of your colleagues? Are you, are you contributing value to the discussions? So a full 40% of their marks is on participation. Then the other 60% is two individual assignments that they do on their own and they're marked and scored. So this is really the only place in the program where we have that very clear individual assessment of are they capable, you know, building a service level agreement for a fictional procurement from scratch. You know, if they can't do that, they probably shouldn't be graduating the program. Please, Mary. Are, are these threaded discussions moderated at all? Yes, yes, for sure, yeah. And they're, and they're, they're open for windows and things are posted at certain times and, and there is an instructor in there, yeah. Yeah, great question. So over four weeks, approximately eight hours a week, you know, people are spending, it turns out, a lot more time than, they, than, than eight hours on it, so we may have to adjust our thinking on that. Uh, but again, recap the concepts, there's readings, threaded discussion and then those two individual assignments that they do, which we rotate from cohort to cohort so they're not the exact same ones. Promotes that networking and collaboration. For example, in the threaded discussion, we have one separate discussion area and it's called a 301 Cafe. And they can just go in and they can chat about anything around procurement. It's not related necessarily to the content. The instructor doesn't even go in there. So it's building that use of the community of practice before they even get into the community of practice. So allows them to network and collaborate so, how long is the program and how much does it cost? It's usually the ones that come up for me. Uh, the program itself is approximately 85 hours start to finish. And we say approximately because of the online components. It's a little bit difficult to, to peg it exactly. About 85 hours from start to finish. Um, just before I go on, we've got the level one, two, and three, you get your certificate. We're actually working on building a level four, which is the strategist level. And that's to deal with the um, knowledge transfer of those people that are at the high level that are leaving. So we, we, you know, the strategist level is gonna be you know, public-private partnerships, different contract structures, surety and bonding, all of those sort of higher level issues. We're framing that up now, we're involving industry in those discussions as well. So there is going to be a level four, but the certificate itself, level one, two, and three. About 85 hours, how much does it cost? Well, there's the cost. So we try to keep it, again, manageable size and cost structure. So about five grand, $5,100 start to finish. So the classroom courses, which include pre and post testing online, two days in the classroom, just over $1,000. And then the, the online introduction course, 695. So try to keep it, again, of a manageable size and structure. Discounts available. Um, certainly, as we've talked about a couple of times, the customizability. So if you have volume registrations, it's sort of a continuum, you know, if you've got volume registrations, you've got five people, you'll get a discount. If you can move along the continuum and say, we've got 15 people, or we can pull together 15 people and host it, you're gonna get a lot greater discount. And also the ability to customize it for the more specific the group, the more customization we can do. So, um, like I say, a school board may approach us and say, we've got five people, but we know four other school boards that can pull in five people, we can have a cohort. We can focus on school board issues, we can focus on the academic sector exclusively. Again, doesn't change the competency structure because the core of the materials remain the same. Customization is done through the appendices and the case studies and that kind of thing. So, it's, it's quite flexible in that way. The more specific the group, the more customization is possible. The more people you have, obviously, the greater the volume discounts would be. 